Okay, hello everybody and thank you very much for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome everybody on behalf of the ISRF team to this webinar celebrating Kimberly Brownlee's book, Being Sure of Each Other, an essay on social rights and freedoms. I'm shortly going to be handing over to ISRF Director of Research, Chris Newfield, who's going to be hosting the event today and who's going to introduce our speakers. But before I do so, I'm just quickly going to go through some uh, housekeeping and in doing so I'll just be going through the slides that you can see in front of you right now. As you'll have noticed we're using a regular Zoom meeting today and in the spirit of social togetherness that Kimberly theorizes in her book we would invite anyone who wants to to turn on their camera. If you'd rather not and if you'd rather keep your camera off that's of course no problem. We have turned on Zoom's closed caption functionality today as well um, in the spirit of accessibility. So if you want to see subtitles on your screen, you can switch these on for yourself by clicking on the closed captions button in your Zoom application. Please know, however, that the transcript is fully automated. And this means that it is bound to include some potentially embarrassing or even rude mistakes. So use this function at your own peril. If you'd like to ask a question during today's Q&A session, please send it directly to me using the chat function beforehand. A curated selection of questions is going to be put to the panelists towards the end of the event. And if you're happy to ask your question yourself, we will ask you to unmute and turn your camera on to do so. But please bear in mind that we're recording the event. And if you'd rather not be on the recording or prefer to ask your question anonymously, we will, of course, be happy to put your question forward on your behalf instead. Please also note that we may not have the time to cover every question during the Q&A session. In total, we're scheduled to run for about 75 minutes. We may go over that slightly, but we will certainly aim to finish by 6.30 p.m. UK time. We're also recording the event, as I already mentioned, and we're aiming to circulate a link to all attendees in the next week or so. Uh, finally, we're going to be sending around a feedback form tomorrow, and we would be very grateful to hear from you about your experience and your opinion. OK, that's all for me. I'm now going to hand over to Chris Newfield to introduce the event and our speakers. Over to you, Chris. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the fourth of our series of discussions of books written by ISRF fellows, past and present, um, all of which are scheduled for the third Thursday of each month. We have four more scheduled before this year's summer holiday that <laughs> all of us, and I'm sure all of you are definitely going to take. Um, Kimberly Brownlee's title is being sure of each other. And her topic, social rights and freedoms, could hardly be more timely. The COVID-19 pandemic has damaged everyone's social existence on a global scale, often in profound and probably not temporary ways. Professor Brownlee helps explain the intensity of our sense of loss of social relations. And she has been working on the social, legal, and philosophical meanings of social relations and social rights long before most of us understood their importance. The book revises, in fact, I think rejects the political philosophy that has long made social rights secondary to our rights as individuals. She sees social rights as more fundamental than individual rights. And I found that her book makes this priority of social rights to say the personal right of association quite compelling. Her work also has profound, even revolutionary implications for social organization that we're about to explore. There's another issue that Professor Brownlee does not treat directly, but that was very much on my mind as I was reading her book. The political cultures most devoted to liberal individualism, such as those of the United Kingdom and the United States, have world beating terrible records of COVID infection rates and mortality. There are of course many factors in play, but what has been notable is that our wealth and our political systems have protected us rather badly while the social relations of other cultures have done a much better job. A few days ago, my 90-year-old mother, who lives in Santa Barbara, California, asked an unmasked patron in a supermarket to put their mask on and was denounced at length as an enemy of civil liberty. In the West, we are not sure of each other. And this strikes me as an important reason why far too many of us have fallen ill. As most of you know, the ISRF provides funding for, to both academic and independent scholars to pursue their research exactly as they see fit, no steering involved, no strings attached, no thematics imposed. 
So we selected this, the current series of books to launch according to data publication and the availability of the authors. Given these random elements, I've been interested to note a pattern that has emerged in the sequence of research. In November, in her book, Freedom, Anna, Anna Lian de Dang argued that the only truly valuable form of freedom is democratic freedom and not the negative individualist kind, even though the democratic form is generally marginalized in the West. In February, in his book, An African Path to Disability Justice, Oche Onazi redefined disability justice through his complex version of Ubuntu, a relational, not individualist notion of personhood, one that also does not require, in Oche's reading, symmetrical capabilities among persons. Last month, in his book, Victory, Kian O'Driscoll argued that to the extent that just war really exists, it must emerge from a collective decision process that bears in mind a nation or group's relations to enemy groups. This evening, Professor Brownlee discusses her deep, argument, her deep argumentation in her book in favor of the primacy of our core social needs. These works, topics, and authors are quite diverse, but they've mounted a profound challenge to the 18th and 19th century liberal individualism that has provided both moorings and limits for the North Atlantic world. And so a brief summary of the format so to recapitulate what Lars just said, uh, Kimberly is going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we have our two respondents for five or 10 minutes apiece. Uh, Professor Ray Langdon coming to us from Cambridge and Martin O'Neill from York. Then Kimberly will respond for five minutes or so, and then we'll open it up for your questions. Okay, so on to the book and uh, for my introduction of Kimberly, and I'm going to introduce each of the speakers in turn as they come up. Kimberly Brownlee grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. She studied and taught for many years in the UK, serving most recently as professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick and has returned recently to Vancouver where she is a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia. Her primary research areas are social political philosophy and ethics and her current work focuses on loneliness, belonging, social human rights and freedom of association. Her past research focused on civil disobedience, punishment and restorative justice. In addition to tonight's book, she is the author of Conscience and Conviction, The Case for Dis Civil Disobedience, which appeared uh, at Oxford University Press in 2012. She has also co-edited several volumes, including Being Social, The Philosophy of Social Human Rights, which is in progress, and Disability and Disadvantage, which appeared with Oxford in 2009. She has also taught or held research fellowships at Oxford University, the Australian National University and Monash University in Melbourne, St. Andrews University in Scotland, Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and has been the recipient of a Philip Leverhulme Prize. Um, I encourage perusal of her extensive publication list on the UBC website, where there's also much to interest those of us who are not professional philosophers. Recent pieces include Freedom of Association in the Time of the Coronavirus, co-authored with James Nichol, Stop Labeling People Who Commit Crimes Criminals, The Myth of Self-Reliance, and Do We Have an Obligation to Live for as Long as Possible? One of the ISRF's credos is applying original research to real life or real world problems. And it's hard to imagine someone who better fits that description than Professor Brownlee or whose work makes it seem like such a valuable enterprise. So Kimberly, it's really, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. And I, I would like to start with some thank yous to the IRSRF before I present my book. Uh, I'm greatly indebted to the IRSRF. It's, it's a wonderful funder. Um, and uh, Chris Newfield, Stuart Wilson, Lars Cornelson, Louise Braddock, uh, a fantastic support team. In addition to uh, the Early Career Research Fellowship, which enabled me to write the book, I've received three forms of support since that have helped to sail the book uh, in, into the ocean. Uh, I received uh, a, a grant to hold a work in progress seminar. Uh, I received a book grant, which enabled me to give some copies to readers and, and now the, this launch. So thank you very much uh, to the IRSRF for your support. Uh, I also want to say a quick thank you to Peter Momchloff at Oxford University Press. He has 
shepherded my work into the light uh, several times, as he has done for many philosophers, and I'm, I'm very grateful for his editorial support. And uh, thank you also to Ray and to Martin for responding to, to the book today. Uh, you're, you're two philosophers I greatly admire, and I'm very grateful you're, you're willing to comment on my book. So I'll, I'll share my screen uh, to, to get us started. So I'd like to begin with uh, a song to reference the song that many of us know, the song People from the musical and the film Funny Girl, sung famously by Barbara Streisand. It captures a core idea that I develop in the book, uh, that people need people, and that we have a feeling in our souls that we are half and then we are whole when we are able to be with people and be of use to people. And the, the second to last line in this bit that I've provided, uh, no more hunger or thirst, um, but first be a person who needs people, that tracks a quote from Mother Teresa, where she also talks about a hunger and a thirst. She says, the most terrible poverty is loneliness, that feeling of being unloved. She says, there's more hunger in the world for love and appreciation than for bread. The philosopher Bertrand Russell also describes loneliness in very vivid terms. He, he says, I have sought love. This is in the preface to his autobiography. He gives three reasons why he has sought love. And one of them is to relieve loneliness, that terrible loneliness in which one shivering consciousness looks over the rim of the world into the cold, unfathomable, lifeless abyss. Now, in, in the book and, and in uh, my comments today, I, I won't speak about love as such. I want to speak about something more modest, something more fundamental, and that is our fundamental need to be sure of each other. And this fundamental need uh, is captured in a moment between Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. They're lost in the woods. And Piglet sidles up to Pooh from behind and he whispers, Pooh. And Pooh says, yes, Piglet. And Piglet replies, nothing. I just wanted to be sure of you. And it's, it's from that little vignette that I, that I got the title uh, of my book, Being Sure of Each Other, comes from that moment. And actually putting the, uh, the image up for you gives me a chance to issue another thank you. And that's to my father who painted the cover image. Um, and uh, uh, you, you'll see that that's a representation of me in there. Uh, and thanks also to my mom who made him paint it four times before she was satisfied that it could go on the cover of my book. Now the, the moment between Pooh and Piglet, it's, uh, it, I, I found it very captivating because Piglet says, I, I just wanted to be sure of you. And that just belies how important being sure of someone is for us as social creatures. We need to be sure, persistently sure of at least one other person in order to survive, not just to, not to flourish, but to survive. And we also need to be persistently sure of our broader acceptance within the wider community. And that second sense of sureness of being accepted, that's where I put some of the focus, uh, some of my attention in the book on our need to be sure of our acceptance within the wider world, not just within families. Philosophers have paid a lot of attention to families, um, but there's a second element to our sociability, being accepted by a community by strangers. And, and so we are all, uh, in a way, people who need people. And we've, we've come to see this, we've had to face this during the pandemic. Uh, there's uh, the New York Times invited New Yorkers this past week to describe the moment where the pandemic became real to them. And uh, this, this one grandmother in Washington, Stephanie Schuler, she said for her, it was the last night that her grandkids stayed with us. 
uh, and that she's gone and laid on their beds and, and cried since then, really missing them. And uh, we've, you know, we've seen it during the pandemic in people who are in the hospital dying and being unable to be with family members, you know, no visitor rules, the prioritization of, of life, you know, which, which obviously has to happen. But the result is that our, our sociability takes, takes a hit and takes a hit we sometimes don't fully appreciate. So my aim in the book is to try to take our basic sociability seriously. I focus my attention on human rights debates and argue that human rights theory and uh, legal scholarship and practice has woefully neglected our social human rights and that needs to be rectified. Um, and I, I also, as I say, stress the importance of our social rights outside of the family, not just within the family. So here are four of the central claims that I make in the book. The first is that we have fundamental social needs that are among the most important, if not the most important needs that we have. Those needs are rights grounding. And in my view, they ground a human right against social deprivation. And I'll explain what that means. They also include a fundamental need to contribute. So it's not just that we are people who need people, we are people who need to be needed. And that need is strong enough to give us a right to be protected in our efforts to sustain other people. And when we're not protected, when we don't get the resources we need in order to try to sustain other people, we're a victim of social contribution and justice. So my aim and what follows will be to give a bit of a flavor of each of those claims. Uh, briefly, before I get into my claims, I'll say something about human rights theory and, um, and this neglect of social rights. So, so the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, 1948, and then the International Covenants that followed in the 1960s, they received some attention from philosophers, but it was really only uh, in the last two decades following Rawls's publication of Law of Peoples that philosophers collectively turned their attention to human rights. And some of that attention was understandably grabbed by 9-11 and the United States response that followed. And so a lot of discussion about the right against torture uh, and also about other civil and political rights, you know, the right to vote, to stand for office, freedom of religion. And there's been a second very substantial debate about specific socioeconomic rights, notably our economic welfare rights, the right to be free from poverty, uh, the right to shelter, health and education. But there's been far less attention, very little attention given to our interpersonal rights, our rights to have access to other people, our rights to be included, our rights to have interaction, to have companionship, to establish joint narratives with people, not to have our bonds severed. Um, and, and that's where I'm hoping the conversation is now turning toward our social human rights. So turning to my first core claim, that our core social needs are vital. There's some support for this in the psychology literature and the neuroscience literature. So we, you know, we all accept that children have, babies and children have fundamental social needs, uh, you know, that a baby will not survive unless they are closely cared for, nourished, sustained, not just to have their material bodily needs met, but there are many functions we won't develop if we are not adequately socialized. And some of those functions are, are ones that are so basic, we almost don't recognize that they're social. Walking upright, swallowing whole food, uh, th those are actually socialized skills that we won't be able to acquire if we aren't adequately, adequately cared for. Um, in addition, there are more obvious ones, acquiring language, being able to understand language, being able to speak, being able to read, being able to write and engage with people, being able to read body language and facial expressions. There's so many social 
skills we take for granted that depend upon, upon being adequately cared for as children. We also have the longest period of abject dependency of any species. We're children for almost 20 years. Um, and, and that is that signals how much investment has to be made into a child's life at the expense of someone else's freedom of association. And someone has to be willing to sign up to that deep and demanding social task of caring for a young person. But it's not only in childhood that we have these deep social needs. When we are adults, we also face moments of acute dependency, giving birth, being ill or injured, um, facing the loss of a loved one, returning from prison, enduring unemployment, uh, being rejected by a community, enduring abuse. There are, there are moments we are deeply vulnerable and need other people's support in order to survive, not flourish, but survive. And we're also built to be social. We have a default network in our brains, which um, when our brains are not tasked to do something, we default to thinking about social content. Uh, my, my mathematician husband tells me that's not true of everybody. Um, but for the vast majority of us, if our brains aren't asked to do something, they will think about social things. And so there's, there, there's a lot more evidence, and I'll get into some of it later, but this, this gives a profile of, of, of who we are as people, what it is to be a person, that we are fundamentally social. And the social needs that come with this have take two forms. There are social access needs. We need to have access, opportunities to be with people. Um, and indeed, as a child, it's not just access needs, it's provision needs. And in moments of acute dependency, it's provision needs. But we also have deep needs to contribute. We have a deep interest in being able to support other people. And I'll say more about that in a minute. My next core claim is that we have a human right against social deprivation. And this actually follows from the ideas I've just outlined. And uh, social deprivation, the idea that you could persistently lack adequate access to human contact, that occurs in a variety of settings. The harshest setting is coercive isolation, when you are forced to wait impotently, hoping someone will come to have contact with you. So solitary confinement in prison. But we've also, in lockdown, had a little bit of that. We have been required to be behind our front doors. And for some of us, that has meant living in overcrowded settings, which can also be socially privative because the key is whether we have adequate access to decent human contact. If we put people in overcrowded settings, those settings can become abusive. They can become settings in which there isn't adequate access to decent human contact. But for people who are in isolation during lockdown, they're enduring a situation akin to that of solitary confinement in prison. They are not allowed to be with other people. And if the government doesn't pay attention to that, you can essentially imprison a good segment of your population in, private, in a private setting. Uh, in, in the United Kingdom, I think it's 12% of households are single person households. And in the first lockdown, uh, the government didn't pay much attention to this. In subsequent lockdowns, they've refined the policy and you can form a bubble uh, with someone else who's, who's alone, which makes it a little less horrific. So that's the second core claim of the book, that we have a human right against social deprivation. The third core claim is the idea that our social human rights include protection of our need to contribute, that we actually have a right to have opportunities to try to sustain others, and we have a right to have the resources we need in order to be able to sustain others. This does not mean we have a right to a friend. Uh, it doesn't mean we have a right to be provided with someone that we can care for and be valuable to, but it, it means we have a right to have the means to try to do that. So in this, this picture that I've put up on the slide, um, you know, we look at the person reaching out uh, their hand and we, we think you know, that, that you know, that's uh, an act of benevolence, that's perhaps supererogatory, and we think about the, the need of the person reaching up to be helped. Uh, the person reaching up in a way is, is Piglet. The person reaching down is Pooh Bear. 
but we have a deep interest in being somebody's pool bear, an interest in being dependable, being depended upon, having value. And one thing that's, that's noteworthy for, for people who've endured incidental isolation uh, or uh, who perceive themselves as being unknitted, unwanted, is they're struck by the sense that nobody needs them, that they are not of value. And uh, some, some psychologists and, and welfare scholars who, who look at loneliness suggest that one way for us to feel less lonely is to be useful, uh, to, to know that somebody needs us. And, uh, and I maintain that, um, that this need is, is strong enough to give us certain rights. Um, and you, you can see this partly in the steps that we will take to try to be useful. I, I begin chapter one of my book by discussing an industry in Japan, a growing industry called the rent-a-family industry. And uh, I, I draw on a New Yorker article written by Elif Batuman in 2018, where she tells a number of stories about people in Japan renting stand-in family members. So one story she tells is of, a, of an older couple whose son won't sit and listen to the father's hard luck stories and whose grandson is no longer a baby. And this couple misses the touch of a baby's skin. They would like to hold a baby, like to hold a grandchild. And so for, for a three hour visit with a stand in son who will listen to the hard luck stories and a daughter-in-law and a child, they pay $1,100. There, there's some other stories uh, in, in this New York article that are, are more, more challenging. One of them is of a single mother whose nine-year-old daughter is becoming reclusive. She won't go to school. She, she won't leave her room. She, when she does go to school, she's being bullied. And it's because her mom's a single mom. And so the mother rents a man to stand in as her ex-husband and to visit her daughter. And she instructs him to respond, no matter what the daughter says or does, to respond with kindness. And, uh, and after a few visits, the, the daughter starts to come out of her shell. She's willing to go to school and to, you know, to, she's able to say, you know, I have a father. And at the time of the New Yorker article writing, nine years later, he was still visiting her and she didn't know uh, that he was not her biological father. Now, uh, to Western ears, some of this will sound inauthentic. Uh, you know, there's, there's duplicity, there's deception, what happens if she finds out? Uh, but the, the interesting thing in the article is that the emotions that the people share in these stories are, are genuine. There is genuine love in these stories. And Batuman suggests that we maybe shouldn't be too precious, too fastidious about the ways in which we come to feel love. Um, but the, I offer the stories as, a, as an indicator of how much we will do in order to have a connection. And in the case of the grandchild having a, a baby to hold, it would seem we have a wish for a connection in which we are doing something supporting. You know, when we are holding, the grandchild won't remember. So when we are supporting someone, that that is deeply valuable to us. And so that uh, leads to the, the fourth claim that we have a right to be protected in our efforts to support other people. And this right in, in my eyes, isn't just a right within families or amongst friends. It's also a right we have out on the street, a right to have micro interactions, to offer small moments of service to each other. And in chapter four of the book, I argue that we actually have a right to be acknowledged. Uh, and, and that's maybe one of the more contentious claims in the book. It, it really, as Chris flagged, it stands in contrast with our liberal individualism, which, which says, you know, I owe strangers nothing. Why, why do I have a duty to acknowledge a stranger? And I frame it as a collective action problem uh, that it, it may not be that any particular one stranger has a duty to acknowledge someone, but if you're being directly addressed and you ignore someone, you are saying, essentially that this person is beneath your notice, but that collectively we do have a duty to acknowledge people. And anecdotally, there's evidence that for people who are homeless, the hardest part is feeling invisible. 
uh, Gregory P. Smith, an Australian man who spent close to 20 years living on the streets, he said that he found when he was sometimes struck or beaten by police officers or passers-by, he found that preferable because they were engaging with him. That the hardest part was to feel like you were see-through. And so my, my final claim uh, in, in the book uh, is that when we're denied what we need to be social, to stay connected, uh, to, to grow in ways that enable us to be someone who, on whom others can depend, we are a victim of social contribution and justice. And this injustice shows itself in, in many ways. It's, it's not just the person put in solitary confinement who will tend to break down. You know, we, do, we tend to become self-abusive, um, violent, we can hallucinate, uh, people can develop suicidal thoughts, the isolation is a horrific experience, and the person's denied a chance to contribute. But also in, in other ways, in less obvious ways, we can be denied chances to contribute. And some of that's through prejudice. So when we have a prejudice against men, uh, that they are less valuable within families, that they don't have a right to the same parental leave, uh, that there isn't the social recognition of their value as fathers, that we're more willing to send them to prison for offenses than we are mothers, we are collectively saying they are not social contributors uh, of equal standing in the family. And that is one form of injustice through, through prejudice. And the other is through actively severing people's chances to contribute. And we do this in healthcare. An older person who receives social care, but gets that care from a different person every week has no chance to develop a joint narrative, to show they're worthy of trust, uh, to bond with someone, to, to, to make a contribution to someone else's life. You know, how's your daughter this week? Or did you get your car fixed? So, so there are many ways in which we can rob a person, rob each other of opportunities, rights supported opportunities to be social. Now, there is not all of our social tragedies are, are rights issues, not all of our, um, not all of the social ills we experience are matters of injustice. We don't have a right to a friend, as I've said, uh, unless we're in a position of extreme dependency and vulnerability. But we do have a right to have opportunities to contribute because we are all people who need people to need us. Okay, I will leave it. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Kimberly, thank you. Um, I just, you have this, um, tranquil and calm way of talking about social rights that kind of belies the fact that if we actually as societies uh, agreed that these are rights and then implemented them it completely transformed society as we know it so i'm really excited to continue to talk about this um, thank you for that um, next our first commentator is uh, professor ray langton uh, she was born and raised in india and was educated in india in australia um, at the University of Sydney in particular, where she got her bachelor's degree, and then in the United States, where she took her PhD at Princeton. She has been professor of moral philosophy at the University of Edinburgh, and also professor in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy at the Massachusetts Institute of, Te of Technology. She moved to the University of Cambridge in 2013. In 2017, she was elected the Knightsbridge Professor of Philosophy uh, and became the first woman to hold one of the world's major philosophy chairs since its creation in 1683. Professor Langdon works in moral and political philosophy, history of philosophy, metaphysics, philosophy of law, speech act theory, and feminist philosophy. In addition to being the author of many influential articles in these fields, she has written Kantian Humility, Our Ignorance of Things in Themselves, came out with Oxford in 1998, and sexual solipsism, philosophical essays on pornography and objectification, also from Oxford in 2009. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2013 and to the British Academy in 2014. She, has, she also appeared in that year on a list of 50 world thinkers of 2014. 
chosen for engaging most originally and profoundly with the central questions of the world today, very much in the spirit of Kimberly Brownlee. So many thanks, Professor Langdon, for being with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very uh, kind, too kind introduction. Um, so I want to begin by saying how excited I am about this book of Kimberley's. I'm, uh, it's a brilliant book and it's helping us get away from the sort of individualistic Robinson Crusoe picture of our uh, ourselves and our relationship to each other um, in the current political uh, world. Um, and I think there is so much in here that is worth running with. And I'm saying that at the, up, at the up, sorry, I'm saying that at the outset because I am going to raise a couple of questions. Uh, things, places where I really want to run with some of Kimberly's ideas are the, the implications for um, incarceration, the implications for uh, the implications for the double or triple punishment that is involved in incarceration, how it's not simply deprivation of, you know, freedoms to go where you want, it's deprivation of a whole social world. And that deprivation is not only deprivation of uh, receiving social uh, connection, but also of giving it. So one of the lovely things about the book is the, uh, the idea that we have an interest in giving and contributing uh, uh, social um, care and contribution to each other. Um, and also what comes out of that uh, is the idea that the families are being just as much punished as the, uh, as the people who are being put uh, in prison. So there's so much that is rewarding here and promising and I want to run with. It also chimes with me uh, with my own feeling that you know, solipsism is the enemy. Uh, and that, that's a theme in my book, Sexual Solipsism. And the idea that um, the moral life is a kind of escape from solipsism, which funnily enough, you find in Kant, even though that's not something he's famous for. And there's, um, there is also, and this is a different theme to anything I've mentioned so far, the hugely interesting idea that um, what we do with language also uh, excludes. So we can use our language in ways that uh, cast people out that, and that prevent us from engaging with them socially. And her example um, is the example where we call someone an offender and thereby cast them in that role. We call someone a rapist and thereby cast them in that role. And uh, Kimberly points out that there's something essentializing about that, which is uh, which goes far beyond anything that is any, you know, legitimate punishment. I would like to take that idea more seriously. Um, for me, it connects with wider issues about how language is used to uh, put people in hierarchies, how we do things with words, we put people in hierarchies, we silence people through what we do with words, um, and we um, change social norms to make um, it easier to do bad things to people and harder to do good things for people. So there's a lot that I want to run with there. I still do have a couple of questions. So I am not absolutely convinced that, you know, the switch from a verb to a noun always brings with it a kind of essentializing move. So there are, um, uh, so yes, it sounds like one thing to say, uh, this person raped someone, and it sounds something else to say this person is a rapist. First of all, um, I do want to comment that it can sometimes be important to say that. Uh, and I, I think that uh, I, we, we saw debates about that with some very famous cases of rape, including the Stanford uh, rape, um, where there was a lot of debate where parents were saying, my son is not a rapist. Um, and feminists were saying, I'm sorry, he is. Um, and this uh, is, um, it, it's a contested question whether this is ever permissible, but there can be political point to using the noun sometimes. Um, there are other points where it seems clear that uh, using the noun is not essentializing. Um, so you can say um, someone studies and they are a student. Without, without the thinking that the student status is part of their whole career. 
Uh, we say that someone is a child without thinking they're always a child. So I wonder whether it might be possible one day to say that someone is an offender in the same way that you say someone is a student. This is a stage, they will get over it. And uh, when they get over it, it will be different. Just to be clear, I agree with Kimberly that we are not at that stage now. And I think that uh, she's absolutely right with the concerns that she's raising. Okay, so that I've mostly been focusing on the things that I agree with so far and I would like to take in some other directions. I want to raise um, two questions now. Uh, I want to uh, raise a question about this idea that a person who badly needs interactions has a right to be aided and the duty to ensure that she's aided falls on everyone who can reasonably take note of her need. I've got two questions. One is about rights and the other is about duties and who they fall on. So the question about rights, as Kimberly herself acknowledges, it's one thing to say we have an interest in this. It's another, and it's one thing to say we have a need here and the need might be hugely important. But to say that we have a right is to say something else. It's to say that somebody else has a duty to, to um, uh, do whatever that right requires. And so in the part where Kimberly acknowledges this in her book, she mentions Onora O'Neill's concerns with the debate on human rights, which is very liberal in identifying a whole lot of different rights, which in Onora's view, are. Uh, end up as being a kind of wish list um, of things that would be nice to have. And uh, Onora O'Neill says, there is no point listing any rights unless you are going to have a, a scheme whereby uh, it, it falls on someone in particular to um, um, do whatever that right requires. So when someone, uh, I myself work on issues about free speech and I'm very uh, used to the idea that when someone says I have a right to free speech, that really means that someone else has a duty to put up with your speech. So rights just are duties. Rights of, of one person just are duties of somebody else. That's my perspective on it. Um, and so if there are these rights, we need to find somebody else whose duty it is to fulfill them. Now, um, I know that Kimberly says that there, is, there isn't a right to have a friend, uh, but I wonder what sort of right there is and, and I wonder whose duty it is to supply that right. Is it the state's duty to make sure that they are not undermining the social resources? Is it the um, duty of the person who the, uh, who, whose social interaction is needed or wanted? And here I want to connect it with a wider issue. Um, when I'm asking whose duties, uh, if you're identifying rights, you have to say whose duties. And um, in a context where there are a lot of people who think they have some rights and they have some entitlement. And there are a lot of people who um, are very polite and caring. I'm talking here about gender asymmetries. Then um, a principle that says we ought to give people the social interaction that they need is going to pose some problems. I'm just going to mention one sort of example. It's the example of street harassment. So street harassment, uh, as everybody knows, and is very much in the news at present uh, in the UK, given some recent events, um, street harassment involves uh, some speakers expressing their need, if you like, for social interaction. Uh, that it might be as simple as, can I have your phone number? You're looking gorgeous. Or it might be uh, using insulting words. It might not. It might be uh, using friendly words. The point is, it places a demand on the woman who is harassed in the street. And calling it harassment and calling the person who does that a harasser is a very important part of the political process of saying this is not right. And in a context where we are going to be um, saying, um, somebody who seeks interaction 
has a right to interaction in a context of gender asymmetry, where we have uh, certain people, certain men, uh, thinking already that they are entitled to a certain kind of social interaction. And then you have certain women who in a context of gender hierarchy are brought up to be polite, are brought up to be caring, are brought up to be exactly the sort of person who does look after the needs of needy individuals, then this is going to be a recipe for uh, exacerbating the existing gender hierarchies. Um, I know that we might find some other way to get around this, but on the face of it, my concern is that we need to pay attention to the existing asymmetries um, of authority and power, existing asymmetries of equality, um, when we are thinking about who has the need and who has the right, if it is a right, and most importantly, who has the duty. There is one point where um, Kimberly says, um, it will be tough for the woman who is a victim of rape, who knows that the perpetrator of the rape um, is going to come back from prison and move back in with his mother who lives next door. That's an example where Kimberly is acknowledging that it is going to be tougher for some people uh, than for other people. And I think that we need to look at the distribution of burdens, look at the politics of the distribution of burdens when we are looking at the need for social interaction and ask the very hard question, whose duty is it to supply these rights? Thanks. Our second commentator is um, Martin O'Neill, uh, not the Northern Irish professional football manager who keeps coming up whenever I try to have a quiet Google of his name. <laughs> um, he's in fact uh, from London. Uh, he studied philosophy, politics, and economics at the University of Oxford and did his PhD in the Department of Philosophy at Harvard University, where he was also a graduate fellow in the Interdisciplinary Project on Justice, Welfare, and Economics. He has been Hallsworth Research Fellow in Political Economy at the University of Manchester and a Research Fellow in Philosophy and Politics at the University of Cambridge. He is currently Senior Lecturer in Political Philosophy at the University of York. In political philosophy, he works on equality, liberty, responsibility, and social justice. He also focuses on issues at the intersection of political philosophy and public policy, including taxation, welfare policy, monetary policy, corporate regulation, labor unions, banking, and financial regulation. He has a substantial bibliography on major public questions, such as, does social democracy have a future? The anxieties of democracy, and Brexit and intergenerational injustice. He is the editor with Dad Williamson of Property Owning Democracy, Rawls and Beyond, which came out with Wiley Blackwell in 2012, and the editor with Shepley Orr of Taxation and Philosophical Perspectives out with Oxford 2018. With Joe Guinan, he has recently written The Case for Community Wealth Building, which outlines a complete restructuring of political economy for the sake of rebuilding and then sustaining public systems on which I at least assume actualizing social rights and freedoms depend. He is one of only, I think two or maybe three people who have been ISRF fellows twice. One as an early career fellow in 1415 and as a mid-career fellow in 2017, 18. So um, although you've never really left Martin, it's really <laughs> good to have you back. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chris, for that that very very kind introduction. It's lovely. Uh, well, it's always lovely to be part of uh, conversations with the ISRF, but it, it's a, a great pleasure and, and a real privilege to be part of this conversation uh, today. Um, Kim and I were, were colleagues uh, at Manchester um, about a dozen a dozen years ago. So um, this feels like it's a conversation happening in the future, um, although. Um, Clearly, it's also the present. So uh, this is a wonderful book. It's uh, it's a fantastic um, piece of work, and 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 it, as as Ray was saying, it it sort of moves beyond a, a very sort of standard sort of problem with a, a particular kind of liberal political philosophy that's often thinking about a sort of very abstract agent. So what what Kim's book does is it puts our agency as moral and political um 
agents it, it, within the social context. It gives, it takes seriously, you know, the social psychology, the developmental psychology of, of, of people's, the, the evolution of people's capacities and the way in which we're, we're socially dependent on each other. And I think it's just a, a tremendous move to sort of have that shift in political and legal philosophy to really take that, that fully seriously. Um, so I'm going to, um, in these remarks, just sort of raise three, three sorts of issues, um, all of which are against the background of my sort of admiration for the, for the book and my being absolutely sure that even where one might disagree with some of the details of Kim's account, nevertheless, this is sort of opening up territory that it's going to be very fruitful uh, to see explored and that it, you know, it's very good to sort of see, see debates developed in this sort of area. So one thing I want to talk about is the register of human rights, uh, which I think also connects up with what, what Ray was, uh, was saying earlier, um, and about whether thinking in terms of a general social right against social deprivation is the right, the right way of thinking of some of these issues. Um, I then want to uh, make a sort of unpopular uh, defense of old style um, individualistic liberalism um, and push back a little bit maybe against um, what might be seen as perhaps the sort of demandingness or even the, the illiberalism of, uh, of Kim's approach. Um, but then the third thing I want to do is really to just invite Kim to say something about where her work's going to go from here. Because it seems to me that when one starts to think about the significance of social deprivation um, of people not having the kind of associational um, background against which they can live, you know, decent or even, you know, or flourishing lives, one starts to think then, and this connects with what, what Chris was saying, in a much more systematic way about how we might need to transform our economic, social, educational institutions to create a society that really, really delivers um, more fully there. So, so to start with um, thinking about, about the Register of Human Rights, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't always sure when reading the book whether, um, whether some of the claims that, that were being made were, were best seen as claims about, about an identifiable human right or whether they were broader claims of of justice or broader claims of right and wrong, or, or even at, at, at points it seemed like, you know, th there might just be important normative work to be done about better and worse social arrangements, you know, where we're thinking about what's optimistic rather than what, what there's a strict right to. Um, and I think there was some interesting moments where Kim talks about, you know, the advantages of, of kind of using the language of, of human rights. This is, you know, it's a very powerful register in which to kind of talk about particular kinds of claims, and it's a way of taking them very, very seriously. Um, but I think that there's a kind of risk, um, there's a risk in that approach as well. So um, there's, there's a reference um, quite early on to, to Joshua Cohen's work on minimalism about human rights, and, and he, he sort of makes the case for why it might be that having a fairly minimal set of rights where you can get broader sense and a sort of wide, wide agreement uh, might be preferable to having a more ambitious and more demanding conception of human rights that's going to be more, more controversial. And obviously Kim's approach is absolutely an ambitious and therefore potentially controversial uh, approach. So given that, the, the, I suppose that this is sort of danger that, that things things uh, can backfire in sort of putting claims in, in the language of, of human rights. And, uh, and especially if the, if the right is kind of um, circumscribed quite broadly as a human right against social deprivation quite broadly understood. So I was, you know, in, in reading Kim's arguments, I was completely convinced that there should be a human right um, against cruel and degrading treatment in prisons that would rule out many practices that happen in current prisons, especially in countries like, like the US and, and, and the UK, and certainly would rule out forms of, of solitary, solitary confinement. I was also you know, convinced that there's certain rights that children have towards um, the kind of protection and nurturing of their, their development in a way that's going to allow them to be moral and political agents. But it seems to me that it would be 
perhaps more powerful to sort of enumerate those those rights more narrowly rather than to subsume that under a, a kind of broader rights against social deprivation so i i so i, I wondered whether some whether some claims could be made you know in a in a way that that was sort of going across a broader normative register than, than fully uh within the the register of talking about human rights um so so that, that that was the first thing the second thing i i wanted to um, talk a little bit about was, um, and Kim mentioned that this might be one of the more controversial parts of the uh, the book, um, the sense that, that Kim's arguing against the kind of standard liberal view about, um, about interactional freedom, the thought that you can just ignore people, you know, you don't owe anyone a sort of a, a response to these sorts of bids for, for sort of social social connection. And one case that, uh, that Kim has is, is the case of Captain Boycott, the famous, um, the famous uh, sort of, you know, rapacious English land agent in County Mayo in, in 1880, right? And the, you know, all, all, all the villagers, uh, uh, you know, they just completely isolate him. No one will have anything to do with Captain Boycott. And this is a sort of non-violent way in which, um, in which, you know this this sort of bad bad actor is is um is, is kind of socially socially punished now i i was reading this you know yesterday on, on st patrick's day and obviously my sympathies are with the uh, the villagers right then you know i i don't want i don't want them to think that they owed owed captain boycott any more than that um and you know they didn't kidnap him and put him in solitary confinement or you know do anything that that seems to me like it would, would be a real rights violation so so i take it that on on well what kim says about captain boycott is that there was perhaps a, a breach of his 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 right his kind of social rights there even if all things considered that's that's justifiable Whereas I take it that something like a, you know, the, the sort of standard liberal John Stuart Mill type view would say, no, you know, there's been no rights violations at all. This is just people, you know, making choices about freedom of association. And you, you don't owe, you don't owe that kind of social interaction to anyone. And therefore, this is a kind of blameless uh, form of, of sort of uh, imposing kind of social, social costs on people. And, and there, I, I just wondered whether, well, my, my sympathies were with, with John Stuart Mill there in, in saying that actually, you know, that that feels like a situation where there to start talking about about a right seems seems perhaps a little bit um, um, a bit too demanding, sort of a bit too normatively demanding and um, just maybe motivationally demanding as well in, in a way that um, it, it perhaps gives a sort of, at, at least a kind of pro tanto entitlement to people that, that I'm, I'm, I'm a bit uneasy for perhaps just, maybe for bad liberal reasons, but I'm a bit uneasy about granting. So I, I, was, I was thinking about what happens to me um, in, in the old days when there was still travel. And, you know, if, if um, in Paris, if I tried to like in French talk to a waiter about the weather, or whatever and i just get haughty disdain right you know someone would you know would look down their their nose at me and think you know i'm not going to engage with this you know this person now i could think all right maybe that was unfriendly maybe you know it it would it would have been nicer it would have been you know more admirable that there, there could have been all sorts of ways in which it um a different kind of treatment would be better but i, I think we're not even if that was the treatment i got from everyone in paris when I try my, you know, my sort of interactional gambits in, in bad French, I, I think maybe I'm being treated unkindly, but I, 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 I can't think myself into that being in, in the space of rights violations. And, and maybe, you know, as long as I can then get on the Eurostar and, and, and come back, maybe that isn't a, a rights violation in Kim's sense either. But I, I worry that, um, that the the account defended in the book might lead one to make sort of rather rather strong claims about um, about the the rights that people have in those sorts of interactional situations. Okay, so then then the just the the last point to raise was um, 
sort of setting aside any any worries about the the specific um, social rights or entitlements that people might have, that there's a huge space that this opens up to thinking about how we organise things economically, how we organise educational institutions, how we how do we create a, a sort of a social environment that's actually conducive to the kinds of, to meeting the kinds of social needs that you know that can very very uh, convincingly examines and enumerates and uh, and explains and i was you know completely convinced that some of the practices that go on you know certainly in in prisons maybe also in hospitals and other institutions are going to be unjustifiable because of the way that they undermine um, uh, people's social capacities or, or harm them with regard to their social interests. But if you think about, um, you know, a, a, a capitalist economy with, you know, with long working hours, with unstable working hours, where it's hard for people to maybe um, plan uh, their, their associational lives, where their economic commitments undermines their, their relationships with their friends and families and so on. It seems to me there might be all sorts of ways in which if we weren't starting from here, but if we were thinking about what would a justifiable set of social arrangements look like where we really took people's social um, interests fully seriously, that this might be uh, a book that that on the sly is is kind of more radical or more revolutionary than it might seem at, 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 at a first reading. And, and so I wondered, knowing that there's another book uh, in process, I, I wondered whether, um, whether the further pursuit of this line of research was going to sort of lead to, to broader conclusions about what kind of social or economic transformation would actually be needed to have a, a, a kind of social a social system that actually gave people the 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 capacity to to live fully decent human lives in terms of their social lives and and, and where people's basic social needs were fully met so uh, I'll, I'll stop there and, and thanks thanks again for uh, for um uh for writing such a an interesting book Kim. on essentialist language I like Ray's example of the student. A student is someone who studies. So why isn't an offender just a description for someone who offends? And I think sometimes nouns hide things. So the noun mother, if that person is 12 years old, you know, that's a very different person from the paradigmatic image of a mother. And right now, the paradigmatic image of an offender is very extreme. And some offenses are extreme, uh, but the problem with making that someone's identity is we lose the fact they may be a father or this may be the only time they've offended or they may have been abused as a child. The, the one thing about prison is it doesn't represent the general public. The people who end up in prison are much more likely to have witnessed abuse, been victims of abuse, dropped out of school, have some mental health problems, have used drugs, have used class A drugs, have had suicidal thoughts. The, the profile is not the general profile. So, so I think I think Ray mentioned this that you know if our society were to see offending differently, then the noun wouldn't be as loaded. And that I agree with. Both uh, Ray and Martin have pressed me on my use, use of the rights idiom, why that framework. And there's an O'Neill's point that social rights are expensive. They are a liberal's wish list. Uh, they are aspirations in a way rather than um, claimable rights. So the one quick response to O'Neill is that all rights are expensive, even the ones she classifies as liberal rights. So to have a right to vote, you need a functioning system. The United States exposes some of the inadequacies in the, in the functioning of its system, partly through its use of privatization, partly through a lack of sufficient investment in that system. Every time it votes, we see how expensive the right to vote, a good protected right to vote is. 
So social rights are not alone. And so in a way, we either acknowledge we have an enormous problem for all human rights, or we accept that they all bring heavy duties uh, on duty bearers. And then we start pressing with where do, whose duty, who has which duties, how do we divvy up the costs? Uh, with respect to sexual harassment, race pressed me in a very, very valuable and important way. If I want to sign up for the idea we have a right to interaction, we have a right to acknowledgement, I have to take seriously these concerns about sexual harassment. And the Sarah Everard story and the, in the experiences in the UK the past week have made this very clear. In my mind, there's a difference between saying, please see me as human and recognize me as your superior who's entitled to intrude upon your attention at this moment. I think many, many men who seek women's attention on the street or who are insensitive to the vulnerability women experience when they're alone, especially at night, they are presenting themselves as superiors and not as human equals asking to be acknowledged as human. Les Green has a great paper on uh, respect where he talks about our duty to recognize people who come within our general sphere of concern, to treat, to think about them and think about them respectfully. When you're not being offered that, when the person's saying, I'm your superior, you owe them less. Another key question is whether you have somewhere else to go. So, so this is uh, Martin's point about Captain Boycott or his own experience visiting Paris. Both he and Captain Boycott have somewhere else to go. Uh, there was all of, you know, all of the arist aristocracy in England was rooting for Captain Boycott. They didn't like the idea their land agent was being treated so badly. So he retired in England and had lots of people who would acknowledge him. Uh, Martin, in his trip to Paris, gets to return home if he feels he's really persona non grata. Someone like Gregory P. Smith has nowhere else to go. So, so when you've hit rock bottom socially, you have a stronger claim uh, that people collectively care about whether or not you're acknowledged. Uh, there's so much else I could engage with. I, I, and if someone in, in the chat wants to press me on something I didn't answer, I'll just very quickly talk about uh, next steps and the economic cost. So with respect to Martin's point about what would this mean for society, David Jenkins is doing some interesting work on commuting. So at the moment, our employers pay us while we take a lunch break or a tea break. They don't pay us while we commute to work. And yet that commute, sometimes for people it's an hour and a half commute, two hour commute, that's time that could be time with family. Uh, and so it's, it's our, you know, we make a contribution to work by getting to it. Uh, so, so I think looking at some of the economic, you know, sort of the hidden things around the social cost. Um, Julie Rose has written a great book on, on uh, free time, on our use of temporal resources. In order to be with family, you need some time. You need free time together. Uh, and so I think if we took that seriously, it would have a big impact on work. Uh, the next book will actually be on uh, interactional ethics, interactional vices and virtues. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say more if anyone wants to press me. But th thank you for the great comments. And I'm sorry I haven't answered them all in full. Thanks, Kimberly. That was really helpful. Um, I will talk to Martin about his issue with Parisian waiters later. Um, we have a first question from Peter Bartlett, who is going to ask it himself. Thank you very much. Um, I better come clean. I haven't read the book yet. Um, I'm rather looking forward to it. I'm a disability lawyer, academic disability lawyer at the University of Nottingham, and my question flows from that. Uh, Article 19 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities quite specifically offers a right of social inclusion. There's so much you've got to say that is relevant to the interpretation of the convention, but I'm going to hold the question to ask you to comment on that. Is that a way forward and does that change the way human rights is starting to think about these issues? Thank you very much for that question. And, and yes, it, it was very heartening to find that. And there are other international agreements that make not quite as overt gestures, but some gestures in, in a similar direction. So uh, European Social Charter, you have a right against social exclusion, but it can be read tip more in line with you have a right to be protected from the impact of poverty, you have a right to social security, as opposed to you have an independent right uh, to remain a member of the community. There, there, the current um, push at the United Nations is to 
develop a convention on the rights of older persons and uh, which you know obviously is a group that intersects with with people with disabilities and uh, and and Henry Shu uh, who, whose book basic rights has contributed a lot to, to human rights theory um, he and I will be will be speaking in the next assembly of, of the open-ended working group at the UN trying to push for greater acknowledgement of social human rights in that document that they're trying to get political energy behind. Um, Henry Xu has actually uh, refined his conception of basic rights to include social rights. In the chapter he's contributing to the collection I'm editing, he argues that our basic rights, uh, it's not just our right to shelter and subsistence, which are basic, it's also social inclusion rights both as a child as an adult and he says these are in fact more basic than basic uh, um, so so there i think there's heartening work uh, that, that's being developed and um you're right that agreement is a very a, a very good reference point um for for where this this work can be can be developed well and how you can sort of sneak new content in under officially recognized rights that's great um second question is from I hope not, I'm not mispronouncing it too badly. Diana Russo wants me to ask, uh, this is to Ray Langton, thinking in terms of needs, rights, and duties, where is a place for responsibility? So I think that um, this is a good question. And sometimes um, people often think in terms of rights and responsibilities. So you can't expect to have a whole bunch of rights unless you're also willing to have uh, the responsibilities, take seriously the responsibilities that go with, um, you know, uh, um, respecting those rights for others and so forth. Um, so I, I didn't talk about responsibilities, but in a way they're implicit in what I said about duty. So if there is a duty, then you have a responsibility to fulfill that duty. And there might be other responsibilities as well, because duties aren't just, you know, all or nothing. Uh, and one question I have is actually whether or not the duties that we have in this case uh, involve a kind of responsibility to, you know, do what we can so far as we are able. And that's the sort of language that Kimberly was using. So it's, um, that picks up on an idea of, that can't call an imperfect duty. So they can, responsibilities can be quite open-ended. Um, uh, and that's one of the things that I find interesting in Kimberley's work um, implicitly, which I didn't get a chance to comment on. So thanks. It's great. Next, we have a question from founding ISRF Director of Research, Louise Braddock. Good. Thank you. Well, it's very nice to see you, Kimberly. And um, I haven't read the book yet, I'm afraid, but we have talked about your work on more than one occasion. And I should just say, I remember with pleasure when we awarded you the fellowship all those years ago. So as Chris was saying, you know, these are, this is a record from the past. It's very gratifying that it's come to the book. Um, I wanted to ask you whether, um, what, what you felt about the language of needs, in particular Wiggins on vital need, um, because I, I mean, I've, I'm not at all au fait with the, as it were, the, the rights um, discourse. And it seems to me sometimes that it's about asserting, or it's about using, it's about using a discourse to try to wield power. I mean, not that you're doing it, but the people do. And that, that the power that's involved in a needs discourse is different because it actually is more humanistic in a way. And particularly in Wiggins's hands, when he argues very, you know, forcefully for the vital needs that people have, that without which, if they are not met, that person will undergo serious harm. Where the serious harm, as I and others have argued, and plenty of people have argued, is a harm to a person's very agency. So it seems to me what you're describing as the sort of vitiation of people's quality of life is effectively through the, the right to, to sociability being being infringed is actually the from, in, from my perspective it's the um the serious harm to them through their agency uh, in respect of others and as a full agent being being undermined so i wondered how what governed your decision to go for rights rather than needs and harms so uh the 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 rights the rights framework 
I've, I've used it for a few reasons. One is I think it does correctly describe what is going on. So when you have uh, an interest or a need that is sufficiently strong that it gives other people duties, then we're in the business of uh, a, a moral claim right, that you have a moral claim right. And um, the, the interest theory, you know, sort of uses language of, of interest rather than language of needs. And I'm, and I'm not sure if that's, if that's an accident. I think each term has, has its problems. So in the case of needs, uh, you know, Gillian Brock and Soren Reeder and others have, have flagged that you really, you have to ask what for in order to get behind or to get to the essence of the need. So I need water what for it could be i have dirty dishes and i you know need water to, to to clean them or it could be i i need water to survive so so simply getting the you know, statement of the need won't give you the details of 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 its importance you know is this a, a non-contingent need a fundamental need a need i have regardless of whether i acknowledge it so i i have a need for food even if i don't want food if i have ever anorexia i still need food in the case of interest uh there, the difficulty really is how do we determine when an interest is, is strong enough? And, and I've relied on psychological evidence to, to indicate that, yes, you know, this one, there's a good case to be made that our social interests, our social needs in that fundamental sense are strong enough to, to give others duties. So, so I think the rights framework is correct in how it characterizes what is going on and it pushes us that next step that it's not just this is a, a good thing or um, this would be a right it this would be right but there is a duty bearer and we then have to do the messy work of you know that an O'Neill wants us to do first of figuring out who has the duty and how strong it is thank you um, I would just like to throw one last thing in here before we stop um, which has to do with negative relations. Many of your examples are positive. I mean, sort of the key ones are about social relations as sustaining and nurturing. And then Ray's example of sexual harassment is about negative interaction. I'm just wondering if one answer to that kind of thing wouldn't be, well, they are providing social relation. It just doesn't have to be the kind that is desired by the harassing man. I mean, I've, I've had friends that particularly and students who've been kind of brilliant negative engagers with harassers, street harassers. Uh, and I'm just wondering if that, <laughs> you've kind of satisfied their right for a response without it having to enter this positive zone of so social relations. Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so in, in the book, I talk about decency, sort of decency and content and decency and form. Uh, that you know the the way you do something, you know, saying to someone uh, sh shut the door in, the, in a gentle tone is quite different to shouting at it at someone. So that the form changes, and so in in rebuffing an overture. So so there is first this question: you know, Do I owe anything at all to the person who solicits my attention, especially when I'm out on the street at night and I really just want to get home safely and I just don't want to be don't want to be bothered. Um, and if I do answer, and, and it's not necessarily because I feel I owe them something, so if they've addressed me in this superior sense, I might feel no, you know, you know I have evidence you have access to other forms of contact, you're not sitting on the side of the street signaling that you're, you're homeless or desperate for connection, uh, you haven't been in prison for the last you know, few years in isolation. The, the, then if I do answer, it will probably be, be self-protective. And, and that's, that's in a way, the, that's the problem that we're, you know, that, and that's what the UK is grappling with right now is how do we redirect energy away, away from those who have to figure out, you know, how do, I res, how do I respond in a way that shuts this down to those who have been insensitive when they, or, or worse, when they've made the overture. So I haven't, I haven't got a good answer, but it sort of, it sounds like negative engagement might still be saying to the woman okay you have some responsibility to to educate or to you know to you you have to somehow be the one who takes responsibility for this moment as opposed to the person who has um improved improperly on your attention yeah but ray might want to say more on that yeah i don't think that i don't think you have any responsibility at all 
um, to educate. It's not your job. Um, your, I mean, this this is part of my question about whose job, whose duty is it? Um, in the in and it, and I don't think Harrises are always feeling superior either. By the way, they might just be awkwardly feeling equal and just. Uh, in, in any case, you know, th these things are structural. They're not just an issue of one person being nasty. Uh, there, there, are, there are structural patterns of enlightenment and hierarchy that feed into this. And I think that the woman, that someone who's in that position has no has a responsibility to uh, get herself home safely. Um, just briefly, if I can continue your, your theme earlier, the, the burden on women. Uh, because I think that is a, a worry about my project that it's saying you know, there, are, there are many more social duties here than we're acknowledging and in our current situation who will be picking those up it will be women and and so there I think that's maybe the, the hidden radicalism that Martin was was flagging that we need to do a lot of rethinking of our institutional design uh, we need to ensure men are properly supported as social contributors at all levels so that it doesn't result in being, this is just more work for women. Yeah, I mean, the full implementation would be the end of toxic masculinity as a sort of like a legal, a, a legal goal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> we should probably leave it there. Um, I just I want to thank the panel. You've been fabulous. I want to thank the audience. I'm really I'm very grateful for your questions and for your presence. Uh, you know where to find us. You want to continue the conversation. Uh, and Kimberly, we're really looking forward to book the book that follows the sequel where you build it out for us. It's been thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for Great assembly time. ISRF. It's very nice. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ray. Thank you for joining us. For ISRF updates and information about future events, please sign up to our mailing list at www.isrf.org forward slash mailing list. See you again soon. Goodbye.